All right, welcome to another episode of the Bottom Dwellers Dive Shack. I'm your host, LV Diver. Co-host, John Villarreal with uh, Port Town Divers. Matt with Port Town Divers. Nice. And do we have a special guest today, uh, Jeff Tielst. I do. Thanks for having me. Appreciate yep. it. That was okay. So, Jeff, where are we at here? This place is awesome. Let our listeners know. Well, we are in the Marine Diving Technologies building at Santa Barbara City College, obviously in Santa Barbara, California. And... Uh, We've been in this building since 1970. Um, the program was actually founded in fall of 1968. So that's where we are, our little purpose-built facility down here. And now uh, can you tell us some of the history on the school? Like, who are the founders? You know, it's, it's really interesting. Somebody once said to one of the other directors that Santa Barbara was not a good place to have a dive school. And his rationale was, it's a very beautiful, nice community right on the beach. I mean, we're a stone's throw from the beach and that people that come here don't necessarily want to leave to go to Southeast Louisiana and the Gulf of Mexico. But there's a reason why this dive school is here and it's strictly my reasoning that for the reason and you know you have to understand that while most commercial diving activity is going on in north sea or the gulf of mexico the early activity was really here in california yeah and this this was the birthplace of a uh, offshore oil diving uh, i'm glad you said that you're wrong um, oh really <laughs> according to that book that i read well I, I, <laughs> you want a story, you're going to get a couple. Let's, so first, let's get a story. why were we here? Because there was a preponderance of commercial diving going on here. And there, were, there was oil. There was a need. Not 10 miles from here, there was an earthquake sometime in the 1800s where in Summerland where oil started pouring out of the side of the cliff. Mm -hmm. Within an hour, I can take you to oil seeps on land, not to mention the ocean, um, where it's just coming out of the, it, it's, and we're having a problem with it, getting into the creeks and getting in the ocean. Oh. So you had oil and they chased that oil offshore, right? You know, we, we put up hundreds of derricks on land, but as we start going offshore and we start building piers out there. Well, almost simultaneously, there was an abalone fishery out here and so there were and the way you get abs is divers get them and so they were diving using the old you know surplus navy mark V helmets and that kind of stuff so you had a need and you had young entrepreneurs that were interested in doing it and then the last little thing was you had two gentlemen by the name of bob kirby and bev morgan um, bob a metal smith tinker bev a surfer I believe like the, the, the first scuba instructor in California who got together and started experimenting, founding Diving Systems International, which now owns 98% of the helmet share in the world. So you've got three things. At the same time, we were in Vietnam, the Department of Defense, this is the rumor, was, was looking, they, they wanted to have marine technicians to support oil and gas development you know, it support the war effort. I mean, one thing you don't know is up in uh, up uh, in Avila, that pier was the major oil distribution port for the, the efforts of World War II. It, it won some kind of recognition, you know, from the president at the time. So, you know, some far-sighted people started thinking and saying, you know, we would like to formalize dive training commercial diving training. And there were other divers. There was probably the most famous one that nobody knows about was, was the um, Spalding School of Commercial Diving down in Long Beach. A lot of the old timers that you may have rubbed shoulders with or have heard about went through that school. So we weren't the first, but we were kind of the first formalized one. And that's how we ended up here. And then how we ended up being what we are was a gentleman by the name of Danny Wilson, who you should do some research on. Well, you probably read about him, who arguably 
there's so many secret things that diving people is fast you know it's fascinating that they don't understand but some would argue that danny probably made the first successful mixed gas dive he did out here in santa barbara channel and he did it in uh, 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 abalone diving helmet that he'd taken over to Santa Barbara radiator and had a second stage regulator soldered into it, you know? And so then he was one of the founders of Subsea International, um, who's defunct now, but their colors are blue and white. Our colors are blue and white. There's a reason for that. And they wanted to formalize a lot of the divers getting into the diving business, um, at the time were Navy divers. Mm -hmm trained in the Navy way. Danny was looking more for college educated young people that he could train. You know, um, Danny Wilson, if, if, if he found a compressor he liked, every compressor that we owned was that model. You know, and it didn't matter if you were in Singapore or Aberdeen or Santa Barbara or New Orleans, it was the same. Well, that's what he wanted with his diving. And that's, that's kind of how we got here. Oh, nice. I want, I want to, I'm sorry, I've spoken a long time. I want to give you one other note. We were not founded as a commercial diving school. We were founded as a school. Um, our, our charter, our objective says something along the lines of, uh, we were to establish a training program for marine technicians to support scientific and commercial endeavors on, in, and around the water. And then the second part was to establish training for people to be able to do, and I'm, I'm butchering the words, um, specialized, ta specialized tasks underwater. So that's what we, were, what we were designed to do, and I think it's what we do too do now nice I, I mean this area has got a huge storied history in diving yes i mean i was referring to the first uh, offshore oil rig was uh was not too far yeah, well, from here and the reason why i smiled and laughed yeah. and let's just assume that pretty much most of what i say is bs that i've made up on the spot and i don't i don't know shit, but it's it'll sound good and be entertaining okay so crack a beer and listen to the stories um i went to bev um to Bev Morgan's 75th birthday party, I think it was. He owned a restaurant down here. And I was talking to Bob Ratcliffe, who was the inventor of the rat hat of oceaneering fame. And I pridefully announced that Santa Barbara was the birthplace of commercial diving. And he said, no, it's not. Santa Barbara was the birthplace of deep commercial diving. Santa Barbara is where the kind of the helium era, you know, epic of our industry took off with Danny Wilson. And then, you know, once Danny did that, well, then the other companies here had to compete and do that too. And you could do a whole show, you know, and I could show you in my office, you know, the one of the first reclaim helmets, our, our first mixed gas helmets um, that, that was made here in Santa Barbara. And it was basically a Yokohama helmet um, that Bob Kirby was, they were talking about how they had to compete with Danny Wilson and offshore divers or whoever you'd think I'd know, I don't remember. Um, and he said, well, and he saw a Folgers can and he, he stuck it on the back of the Yokohama and he said, we'll just make this Venturi rebreather, reclaim kind of system, semi-closed circuit system. So yeah, Santa Barbara is a mecca for diving, but I've seen a picture of Alexander the Great on some stamp, you know what, my history fails me, but it was, I think BC was Alexander the Great in like a wooden barrel, so. That's great. Yeah. Now, I, I mean, history itself, you know, has, they, they've been doing it since the ancient times. You know, I think sure. the Romans even had, had a dive team going, which was kind of kind yeah. of funny. Pick up the urn, urn yeah. or whatever. That's great. But yeah, so was that like an argument back then? Like, oh, who did it first or who did better? Or where do we do this and that? I mean, now nobody cares, you know? But yeah, I don't know. You, you know, one of the weird things is that there was a time and, and I hope that your viewers read that book into the lion's mouth. I'm sure you guys are well aware of it. If you're not, I'll give you guys a copy. Oh, it's nice. That'd be great. Incredible book. And he talks about the Santa Barbara mafia. So, you know, in the late 
in, in the very early 70s, a lot of the commercial divers out there were from here. You know, it, it would not be particularly unusual in 1972, three or four, graduate, get on a plane, be in a bell, you know, 48 hours later in the North Sea. Um, so yeah, there, there, there really is a lot of history. And, you know, we would go down there to subsea and most of us were, you know, we're, we're Santa Barbara guys. It was, it was really a trip. And there was, you know, really some animosity between the local people you know, because we'd go down there and we're from California, right? And we're like, um, it's really flat here. It's really hot here. Uh, your girls are not particularly attractive compared to the ones we have back home. You know, that would really piss them off. <laughs> and I remember um, I made friends with a guy from Morgan City, which is if I owned hell in Morgan City, I would live in hell and rent out Morgan City. It is not a nice place. You may want to edit that out. <laughs> no, um, we're keeping yeah, that in. Keep um, <laughs> nice guy, though. And, you know, you guys know as well as I do, you can't do this alone. You need a mentor, right? You, yeah. you need somebody to show you the tricks along the way. And this guy's name was Buddy. His real name was Ernest, but he was from the South, so fuck it was Buddy. And uh, I used to just bust his calls all the time about how beautiful Santa Barbara was and how subsea was founded by Santa Barbarans. And we were, you know, there was, there was an inherent superiority to West Coast divers because we're used to cold, bad viz, you know, bad, bad conditions in the water. And he, he hated it. He was senior to me. And I'll never forget, we did a job up around Point Conception it was a sat surface gas, surface air job. We've been out there a long time on a beautiful Dutch barge. And this crew boat, a Tidewater crew boat, uh, oh, not a crew boat, a supply boat came up. Probably 2, 30, 40, a, a bigger boat at the time. Beautiful. Just it was beautiful, brand new. And it said on it, on, on the bow, you read its name was Pacific Pride. And I took, grab buddy, I took him over, I said, buddy. That's, look at that. That's the difference between <laughs> us and you guys. That beautiful boat, blue and white with North Sea stacks, and you got those scows down in the Gulf. Man, look at that. And, he, you know, he was pissed. And so I took off, walked away a little bit later on. He comes, he grabs me, he goes, come here, And he goes, man, he drug me over there. And we went to the stern, and it said, Pacific Pride. Morgan City, Louisiana, <laughs> and he had a styrofoam cup in his hand. He threw it in the ocean. You know, of course, I freaked out. <laughs> yeah, because you're from California. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I'll never forget that. That's great. Yeah. But yeah, now now diving's a worldwide. You know, everybody in the world, you know, has their divers. You know, oh, you got sure, like, Chinese divers, Singapore. You know, Indian, and you know, they're Egyptian. all good. Yeah, Egyptian. We actually do have a worldwide following on the show, which I'm really That's proud cool. and excited about. Mm -hmm. We've uh, we've got listeners from s over 70 countries. Wow! Which to me, it's it's amazing. That is you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's cool. It's so great to be here today to talk with you, Jeff, mm -hmm. and uh, to Thanks. see the school. Um, because again, yeah, it didn't start here. Maybe you know that's up in the well, air. I mean, but it's the general birthplace. You know. Well, it, it has its spot now. in yeah. the history. You know, exactly. It has a spot in the world of commercial diving. So, yeah. And being from the 70s, it's a, a testament to the program because, unfortunately, this is the last yeah. dive school in California. Yeah. That boggles right. my mind yeah. still. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there used to be Coastal School of Deep Sea Diving up in I, Oakland and then College of Oceaneering. College of Oceaneering, yeah. We used to do a cool thing, at least, well, I wasn't here then, but when I was a student here, we would go down, we would dive the uh, College of Oceaneering system, mm -hmm. and then um, they'd come up and dive our stuff. It was, it was kind of neat, you know? I'd, we'd spend a day at each other's facilities. That's, that's pretty cool, cool. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's, that's still kind of pretty crazy to me, though, you know, with this being the only school in California now. Um, part of it, too, is that uh, a lot of these schools, they find it kind of hard to hard to survive, you know, now given we've heard stories about certain uh, certain schools that their success rate, you know, their pass rates, you know, pretty much almost 100 percent. You know, you don't hear of anyone, you know, failing these schools they are paying their thirty thousand dollars to go there and and uh, and they're guaranteed a, a dive card, you know, but this school is not like that. 
Yeah, I mean, when I went here, we had, I think it was about a 50% success rate from the dive physical uh, and the swim test to the guys who actually graduated. Now, is that saying, that's that's not saying that um, the staff is not doing a good job. It's, I, I, I mean, why is the, the pass rate a little different here? Well, I can't speak to the other schools and their paradigm, but um, ours, our clients are our students for sure, right? But our clients are also the employers that hire our students. And, you know, you and I were talking a little bit um, earlier about how you, how you grow within this business. And it's really your reputation, isn't it? You know, when, when I decided I wanted to move back to California, I made a couple phone calls to people I knew. I didn't send them resumes, or if I did send them a resume, then. I don't know if they looked at it or anything. So Santa Barbara City Colleges, you know, we we live and die by our reputation. We're also a state-funded school. So, you know, we I I won't die if I don't have a full class. Does, does that make sense? I, you know, if, if I don't have 50 students, I'll, I'll, I'll still get my funding. I'll, I'll still... Um, still be able to run the program and, you know and then part of it is a personal thing for myself and and the faculty here is you know we have professional reputations dan works in the summertime you guys have worked with him mm -hmm. i i work in the summertime i go off still go offshore a little bit and we're not going to for one thing we don't pass or fail students we count scores right, right. and all we can do is teach to the standard and then assess fairly and objectively and i mean i i i have a four-year degree i have a bachelor's degree actually from you guys from cal state long beach nice and, and education you know i took a whole semester long class on assessments and that's such a big part of what we do you know is to make sure that we have fair and accurate assessments but to get to your point um not everyone is cut out for commercial diving and it may be just from an intellectual capacity or a lack of intellectual curiosity um here's how i lose students it's a really simple deal um, i'll lose a couple of them that bust out in the physical either sometime because we have to we're under the auspice of the united states coast guard you know you guys are under the auspice of the united states uh, of osha and so drug use is not allowed even if you have a 215 card i think that's what it is so everyone gets drug screened so that can bust people out people it's rare but on occasions we get people that had a polyp on their lungs some condition they never knew they had that really it, it means nothing terrestrially but could be fatal underwater so they go away and then we have the swim evaluation it's not the hardest swim evaluation in the world um, but you have to be able to swim. Hoping you can swim ain't gonna get it, you know? Yeah. Being out of shape ain't gonna get it. Being hungover, uh, you know, probably not your best move. Um, so we will lose 15, 20, sometimes 30% in the swim test. And then I told you before we're modular, so we go on eight week chunks. So like the quarter system, if any of you remember that mm -hmm. back from college. Um, it's the first, the first quarter is the hardest. In my mind, Matt, maybe you could uh, extrapolate a little bit more, talk a little bit more. Um, but we start at seven, which means I want you here at 6.30, no later than 6.45, right? Because if you miss the crew boat or you miss the helicopter, you're only gonna miss it once around me, I promise you. I'll just get another. I mean, tenders are super easy to get. Um, so, you know, Dan teaches so much, so much what Dan teaches is, you know, the equipment, how to work the equipment, how to maintain the equipment, how to, you know, don the equipment, how to use the equipment, that kind of stuff. And, and I teach mixed gas diving, some, and some of the other stuff, but I really feel that it's appropriate and important for me to teach the effective skills that make you successful. You know, being on time, being reliable, hard work, that kind of stuff. And, and I, I'm not getting off topic, I'm gonna get there. So a lot of young people 
are not prepared to get yelled at at 6.45 in the morning. <laughs> so I tell them, get here at 6.30. My guess, I'm not sure, it's been a long time since I was in this school, but as much learning goes on in that parking lot at 6.45 than does in this classroom at 7.45. They're sharing notes, they're star sharing homework, they're sharing stories. You know, they're bonding within their, their, their group. And you walk in here at 7.02, and all I gotta say is thank God for tenure. <laughs> because if the administration ever heard what comes out of my mouth, it would be interesting. <laughs> I don't like it if you're late. So some of the young people are like, Ooh. I've had a student quit that came to school here and worked for my brother at in the evening in the grocery business and he quit common one day and we finally found him and I said I can't remember his name whatever I go, why why'd you quit work he kept coming here he didn't go to, he goes because I couldn't take you yelling at me all day and then your brother going getting in on me all night you know <laughs> wow. It's, Welcome it, to the dive business. Well, that's it, man. I don't want to lie to these young people. I don't want them to spend you, you time. Don't want to lie and, and, and tell them they're going to be underwater welders no. making millions. And, no, they're not going to make a hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> you know, they're not flying all over the world. They're not picking up gold doubloons in the Playboy pool. None of that shit's happening. I just saw this video, and the, they were interviewing the head of. Um, I think it was the head of Shell Deepwater. It, it was somebody like that. And he said, you know, and, and again, I'm an oil guy, so I'm speaking from an oil perspective. You know, it, there's so many different, we could talk one day, or you, you're perfectly um, you know, prepared and, re and ready to talk about civil diving versus offshore. But, you know, you find oil in hospitable or inhospitable areas of the world. You know, if it's dark, cold, rough, nasty, remote, that, that's where you're going to go to work. And so I want people to understand, you know, this is what you're, you're, what you're getting into. The other thing is, so when I was young, they called this vocational education. It's gone through iterations of names. It's now called career technical education. And people, you know what I'm saying, and your viewers are going to know as well. A lot of times people think that the trades are for dummies. And, and I don't know if I've articulated that correctly, but that's what it, it's not. It's not. One, the trades right now are the hottest thing in the job market. You know, I wish my son were essential a, workers. Yeah, we are, yeah. you know, electrician or a plumber or something. But, he, okay, so my deepest dive was 605 feet. I was at the five feet because I want to make sh damn sure everyone knows <laughs> it's deeper than 600, you know, because that's 100 fathoms. So don't, don't think that I'm glorifying myself or anything, but I was breathing 98% helium, 2% oxygen. Anything less than 16%, you're dead. How is it possible? Mm -hmm. Physics, it's possible with physics. You know, the, all the stuff that we do, you, you know, okay, go pick up that three meter by three meter by three meter concrete slab. Okay, well, how much flotation do I need? There's a lot of math involved in diving. Now, thank God for us, it's simple math. You know, it's solved for X. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, the quadratic equation or polynomials or anything. It's, it's relatively simple stuff. But by virtue of what we do for a living, it's almost always a word problem. We all know word problems are hard. So I'm going to lose... Um, I'm gonna lose, well, we're in physics right now. We have, what, 20? I'll lose 10 to 15%. Promise you, it, it mm -hmm. just can't do it. S some of them can't and some of them won't. Well, that, that's the thing is a lot of the stuff that you're going through, it's not subjective. It's check boxes and it's also test scores. Well, God, and I hope they don't it's pass not it, subjective because if you're counting on me to be I'm subjective. I'm telling you, I'm hinting. I'm just saying I don't understand the success rate of some of the other schools that are operating. Now, given there's some that are, have been shuttered that are in the process of being shuttered and uh, because they were doing things that, 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 you know, wasn't to the law, you know, they're doing illegal stuff. Um, we're not going to get into that. But I was just, uh, like I said, I was really curious about the, uh, 
the washout rate. Let's call it washout, I guess, here, because yeah. that's what happens. You know, they, they don't pass the classes, they don't pass the courses, and then that's it. They're done. Um, now, can they come back and retake those classes? Is, is it on just a like space, a college? Yeah, on a space available basis, they can. I mean, and there's always space. So, yeah, they can come back the next year and retake those classes. Um, but just because they paid the money, they're not guaranteed a dive card. They still no. have to actually pass the class. Yeah, yeah, that's the way we do it around here, pretty much. Why is um, that last not? Last time I checked, <laughs> if you don't do the work where you guys are, they're not going to hand you the check. Right. Right. And you ain't getting it here for free either just because you want it. I don't care. So you uh, don't know why that's not standard? I don't know. I'm just saying maybe they're saying that it is standard, but yeah. I don't understand how you're having 30 kids that are going in the start of the class and you've got 30 that are graduating at some well, of these places. You're not doing the young person or, or I don't know, young, we have some older. You're yeah. not doing the student or the graduate any favors because this business, you know, it, it, it sorts you out pretty damn quick. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're the dude standing there with a coffee cup in one hand, your hand in your pocket, and the other guy's got a crescent wrench looking very concerned, who do you think's going to be going on the next job? It ain't going to be, you know, clown one. It's going to be the dude that cares. That's Diamond's pretty simple, really. You know, you have to have the natural ability to, you know, mechanical skills, and you just got to give shit. And they're pretty much sad at that point. I mean... If you're not good at math, it's not like you're going to fail. You no. get better. You know, you study, you, you know. Well, the college spends millions of dollars on tutoring and math. We have a math lab. Typically, we have found that, and I'm, the math lab is great. The writing lab is great. The problem is our kind of math doesn't really translate that well. They don't understand what partial pressure and why is it important. Well, it's really freaking important. But so if I can at all, um, I will get students, the returning students or, you know, other students to help. Also, we have a great relationship with the library. They'll give us learning spaces. They'll give us our own spaces where you can have group learning. Nice. That kind of stuff. You yeah, don't have to be Einstein. You just got to want to do it and take use the resources we give you and solve for X. It's always an X. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's what we're getting at here. It's not one of those... Or you just kind of look at them and by what they're saying and the way they look and the way they're working, we're not saying that, oh, dude, you're not going to make it. Sorry, I'm going to fail you. <laughs> it's not that, you know. No, and you it's, know I learned on the very first day that I was a teacher, day one, a Monday, I came in here and I looked at the class and within a second or two, I had decided in my mind who was going to be successful and who wasn't based purely on looks. And I know they looked at me, looked, said, who the hell is this guy? And I can tell you this, you know, this is my 23rd year. I was wrong. I was nice. completely freaking wrong. You know, the good looking, wealthy little white kids from Sonoma. Nope. There was this one dude, probably from Long Beach, looked like a freaking gangbanger. I'm like, no way. That's the dude that made it. Right. It's the dude making the, the millions. Right? Yeah. <laughs> now, you can make a lot of money that, in this trade. You can. Yeah. No, you can. We're, we're not telling you you can't, guys, that are listening. And you that's can a make true money. story. Yeah. 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 He's probably in set right now. Probably. probably. <laughs> listening to the Bottom Dollar's Live Chat. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's just the way we run our school. You know, we try to be as legit as possible. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know, really know how we should grow that topic too no, much No, I more. mean, you pretty much answered that question, you know, right there. And uh, that kind of kind of speaks to, I mean, because you, you're going to get paid the tuition, whether they pass or not. So I'm pretty sure that helps you also. Uh, not, yes you and know. no. <laughs> I, uh, if they la I think they have to last four weeks for me to get paid. One, I don't get the tuition. Right. But the state gets the tuition. Yeah. Um, two, the tu tuition is so paltry. That doesn't matter either. Um, you know, their tuition's 
like I told you, like $1,700 or something. Yeah. It's the funding I get from the governor's office. That's, that's what keeps us afloat. So. I'm just saying it, it, it definitely affords you a little bit more, uh, more freedom, I would imagine. You know, to not be beholden to like shareholders or something. You know, oh, yeah, you know what? That, that sums it up right there. Certainly. You know, if your job relies on student success or profits, well, you might sharpen that pencil a little bit more, or use the eraser. I don't know. Things happen. I'm guessing. Right. And uh, yeah. So. I mean, that's kind of kind of just a question that I had about that as far as like, you know, different different success rates and stuff like that. And and you answered that really well. well you, know, you, you can't know. speak to what other schools are doing because you don't know. None of us know. Mm -hmm. But um, there are students here that don't make it because they're not passing the classes or they're not meeting the requirements, you know, checking those check boxes. So. Well, I mean, just one just more thing and you know, we can move on. Um, student success and job placement are are two huge things for in reality, but also for your advertising, right? You're advertising, I had 97% success rate and, you know, 93% of them get the jobs that they're applying for. That looks pretty damn good. Well, another school that's no longer here, the only other one in California, I, I want to say that it's advertising budget for a year was about $125,000. And I know the director at former director now, uh, mine is $500. So wow. we have no advertising, so I don't have to worry about that. You know what I buy? I have koozies made up. If I have any, I'll give you all a koozie. Oh, nice. Perfect. I and I give them to the students. I might even use one right after the show. Very <laughs> Well, and I tell them to put Cokes in, but I, <laughs> once they leave, I don't give a shit what they put in it. Well, speaking of advertising, Let's pause for a quick second and hear from some of our uh, wonderful sponsors. Dun, 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 dun. All right. All right, perfect. All right, coming back in three, two, one. But yeah, so I, I mean, a, a lot of a lot of schools' hands are tied because of money. Well, I wouldn't even say hands are damn tied. You know, it's just kind of a sad state of affairs. But uh, I'm glad that you guys are, are doing well here and uh, uh, you're putting out some good quality students. And uh, the ones that, you know, aren't getting put out, you know, they're, they're, they're you know, I'm just saying they're probably not going to make it anyways. No, probably you know, not. So, and, and in all fairness, you know, we teach, every dive school teaches to the American National Standards um, ACDE-01-2015, it's called the minimum standard for commercial diving. We go above and beyond a little bit because of some of the other, you know, seamanship and other classes, and we have academic classes as well. But you guys know as well as I do that when you get in the field, that's where the learning begins. Mm -hmm. You know, I sort the biggest rocks. You, you get out there and you don't want Matt yelling at you and telling you that today we'll be working 18 hours and dinner is the burrito off the roach coach. Sometimes they're pretty good. Yeah, no, sometimes they are. <laughs> sometimes they are pretty good. But you 100% will pay for it later though. Right. Your body will. Yeah. yeah. All right. But I tell you what, man, this is not a trade. This is not a trade for everybody. And, no. and, and uh, thank you for being honest. Um, speaking of not being a trade for everybody, um, really glad that Matt was able to join us today. Yeah, but, right on. I haven't seen and, him in a while. Uh, I'm just kidding, dude. Don't look at me like you want to stab me in the neck. <laughs> Such a tool. Huh? <laughs> no, uh, no, I, I, I wanted to know kind of when you knew that this is what you wanted to do, mm -hmm. you know, when you knew that this trade was for you, you know, and when you decided to, to make this a living. You know, it was weird. I don't, I don't know that I ever had that catharsis, you know, that epiphany. Um, my story, real briefly, as I grew up in Santa Barbara, um, the fifth kid, the last kid of older parents. And, you know, by the time you run through five, it's like, as long as 
he kind of makes it home more or less alive. That's golden, you know. So I, I was pretty free. And I spent a ton of time down on the beach. And on the beach, you know, you, you kind of meet some interesting personalities. And I spent a lot of time in the harbor. I'd listen to it. Back then, it was abalone divers or stories and stuff. And um, one day I was walking along, I was going, it followed it like a lot of us. I followed a girl to college and I saw the diving bell going up and down. And I, and I was a surfer. That was my big deal, big surfer and a scuba diver too. My brother was really into scuba diving and I followed him. I didn't really want to do it. But anyway, long story short, I went down, asked them what they did. And they told me they make commercial divers work all over the world. And you can make $85,000 a year. Well, this is 1978. You know, I it's like a million from, dollars now. <laughs> I was freaking out. I'm like, sign me up, man. I'm your guy. And I went through the program, and it's the only thing I've ever been good at, you know, really good at. I was an okay athlete. I was an okay student. But for some reason, I was really good at this. And, you know, I, I liked the work. I liked what adventure there was. Um it, it just fit me. It, that's all. It just it, it fit me really good. And, you know, some of my friends would say I was too stupid to do anything else. I don't know. Maybe that's true. It just um, those of us that have been in the water know how I felt and what I felt about it. And a student came back, and this is something maybe the people that are contemplating this business should consider. Um, this was kind of this, this guy I never thought would really make it, you know, mousy kind of guy from the Bay Area. And he did. He went and he did it. And then he quit. Um, and he came back to me and told me he'd become a paramedic in Denver. And he said, Jeff, there's a thing called, the, I keep, there's a thing called the seven-year rule. And he said, at the seventh year, that's when you have to make the decision. You either get out or you stay in. And I think he's right, because it's seven years. If you, if this is the business for you, you'll never be able to make this much money again doing anything else. You know, yeah. and if and then if you quit and move on at seven years, maybe you can parlay what you've learned into being an EMT or a paramedic or a union welder or whatever. But you know that was certainly true for me. And it was probably right around five years for me. There was no way I was ever going to make more money. And, you know, I when I said I had a bachelor's degree, I went back and got my bachelor's degree after I started here because I realized that throwing stuff at the students and yelling louder wasn't effective teaching methods. So I decided to learn how. So before, all I had was associate's degree. And that little associate's degree from Santa Barbara City College made me more money than any of my friends with their engineering degrees or my wife with a master's degree from Tulane University. Now, it wasn't, they didn't just send me the check. You know, I had to get on a boat or a barge or chopper or whatever and go work and, you know, do nasty stuff for long hours. But, you know, Jeff Tills owns his home and drives a piece of junk truck only because i too cheap to buy a new truck at 50,000, I ain't doing it. It's a freaking pickup truck. But so. that's true, though, too. I, I mean, at, at some point, because I had the same thing, too, where you become a successful diver, you know, say you, you've broken out or you got mm -hmm. to the point to where you're, you're, you're not hunting around for work too much, um, you still do have that decision to make because it's a life. It's a tough life. You know, especially when you do have kids and stuff. And, exactly. and uh, I was going through that decision. Fortunately, I was able to make the right decision and, uh, and join the Port of Long Beach team. But uh, I was at that point to where it's like something's going to give here. I either better get better at carpentry or, uh, you know, well, think about giving up the, 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 the trade. You know, That's a perfect point. I mean, that's so viable. I'm really glad you brought it up because... You know, your diving career is an evolution. And so for me, I didn't get married till I was, I think, 35 or something like that. I was dedicating my life. But then I think in all of our lives, you get to a point where that stuff that was fun at 2 in the morning on Christmas Day, you know, away from your family ain't fun anymore. 
So now what do you do? You know, do you, you buy a Jiffy Lube, 7-Eleven? You, I got into management. You found a, a, a union, you know, 410s or whatever it is you guys do job. Um, yeah, I, I, I have friends in their 50s still going offshore. And there are guys that do it, but I didn't want to. I got married and had a baby girl. I want to see the baby. Yeah, I, I mean, at some point, some guys don't have a choice, you know, because you know, at, at some point, you're you're kind of stuck in the trade, and uh, you just got to run its course, yep. you know. And yes, you do make good money, but you know, sometimes at what cost, you know. Yep. And uh, kudos yeah. to those guys that are out there doing it, listening, mm-hmm. um, that are you know, at times have felt that you know, I don't know, it's it's kind of a touchy subject, you know, to tell you the truth, because it's like we love what we do, but it's like at what cost. You know, well, if I would say and not to pitch my own school, one of the cool things about us is you can get an associate's degree, which means you're getting the oceanography, the biology. You know, you have to have your your basic basic math and English skills, you know, your social sciences, that kind of stuff. And I think that what makes you successful as a commercial diver, are those effective skills. Are you honest? Um, are you on time? You know, do you work hard? Do you learn from your mistakes? Those kind of things. And those, to this day, I still have to have those skills. But if you want to move into to being a supervisor, a superintendent, or a management position, they're going to hand you a project execution plan, a set of prints, and say, go for it. And you need to be able to read that. You have to be somewhat articulate. Spelling and grammar is important because you have to write a report. Um, you know, so academic skills are what are helpful later on in your career, right? I mean, sometimes you got to negotiate a change order on the spot, or you know, at least you tell your client, "Hey, we're off the ticket now. This is what it's going to cost you per hour, per day, whatever." I don't know about you guys, but every morning at six o'clock, I have to have the report from the day before sent in for their seven o'clock meeting. But yeah, I, I mean, like I said, there, there there's some uh, divers that we know that are still going strong, you know, mm-hmm. past 60. We just talked about Ralph yeah, for the American Ralph. Marine and, you know, he's still diving his Yokohama, which is which is pretty crazy to me. But uh, hey, more more power to yeah, him. No, you know. They're still out there. God bless them. All right. Well, we're going to take another quick little break. Uh, We're going to hear from one of our sponsors. All right. Well, we're back here at uh, Santa Barbara Community College uh, speaking with Jeff Tielst. And, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely been a pleasure. Um, And do do you have anything else you wanted to ask, Matt? Uh, Yeah. I mean, just, Jeff, you've got sort of legendary status among uh, past MDT graduates as being a, a guy with tons of stories about diving. I know you did some deep dives. So if you've just got any any stories, any oh shit moments, or just you want to chronicle, you know, a couple dives or any stories, we'd love to hear them before we wrap this thing. All right. Well, um, interesting segue. Y- y- one thing about our school is that we intentionally put students under duress. In fact, on the swim test, we intentionally put them into oxygen deprivation because we want to see how they react, right? And we've actually had some discussions with um, administration, some city officials about some things that have happened in the pool with students. And, you know, I always tell them, listen, we want them to happen in a controlled environment in the pool so that they're not experiencing it for the first time in real time. Um, And... So what I want to say is we, when a student comes to City College, they have to sign waivers that they understand that diving is an inherently dangerous activity. And we do our very, very best um, to make it as safe as possible. I mean, obviously, safety is paramount in, you know, it's a value, not a priority. It's all about safety. They take the knives away, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it, 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 anybody that spends any time in this business is going to 
find themselves in a sticky wicket at some point, right? It's just, it's going to happen. And, and thankfully, I'll, I, I will eventually tell your story. And well, that's why question. we asked for it. So that way we can learn so, from all these well, experiences that other divers have. You know, when I got into the business, people getting bent was pretty damn routine. You know, if we were on deep jobs or on gas jobs, it would not be unusual for somebody who's been bent. I've been bent four times that I can remember. Um, when I left the business, you know, when I went into management, when I left offshore, which would have been 96, the bends rate at at the time, I was friends with the, the safety guy over at American Oil Field Divers. He told me their bends rate was somewhere on the order of one in 15,000 dives. So our students could easily go through their, their entire careers without ever seeing a bend. But chances are, you know, I've lost gas on bottom a couple times. Um, you know, I, you don't, I don't even remember. You know, some of the stuff, most of it was pretty benign. It was, hey, I lost gas. I had a bailout bottle. Unfortunately, back then we didn't wear bailout <laughs> bottles. So I didn't fucking have one, but I had a pneumo hose. Don't let anyone <laughs> tell you that won't save your life because I just saved mine twice. Nice. Um, but I remember one story, and I think that this story will go with me for the rest of my life or this this incident it's a story to you it's my life and i will tell you this and your listeners this and my colleagues in my age group and level of expertise knows i stress out a lot more about the accidents that could have happened to friends of mine rather than the ones that happened to me. I wake up at night. My mom, my mom, my wife says I talk at night. I know I talk at night. I can still see the bell stuck right at the water level with eight foot waves coming through and beating the hell out of it with two of my best friends in it. You know, I remember those. The ones, because I was a superintendent. You know, my story that, that happened to me is, it's a good story and but I, I don't dwell on it at night. I just think that's maybe human nature. Maybe it's just me. But I was uh, in SAT with a new Bell partner, um, Tad. Good dude. Still in the business. A uh, really good guy. Came from Taylor, which was weird because my company, Sub C, we typically didn't. We like to grow organically. We typically didn't bring people in at higher levels. But I'm glad we got Tad because he was a good dude, man. And um, the diving supervisor was a Marine Tech graduate. And um, we had, don't ask me why, we had brought a consultant in um, to help out on this particular project. It was a scrapping job where we were, I don't know why they did it first, but they had us removing the debris around a platform before they removed the platform instead of vice versa. But whatever, who am I to say? That's right. what they did. It's for. Yeah, I don't care. Hey, put debris in basket, you're paying me. That sounds, whatever you want. Where's man. the money? Yeah, where's <laughs> the money? And so the consultant was a, a Marine, was actually a faculty member here in the Marine Tech. And um, I was the second, per I was the bellman. I was the second person that was gonna lock out that day. And Tad was out. And what they did is they had a skiff or a skip, I don't know what it's called, but it basically a dumpster, you know, but a giant one, you know, the ones mm -hmm. that are on, they're eight foot wide by 20 feet long or yep. something. And one end of it was open. And so we had picked up all of the stuff that we could pick up by hand and throw in. And what they had was a sonar, a sonar down there so they could track us. They could see us because of our bubbles and our bailouts. And then they, they would just go, you know, go to your left or your right. And they would send us to go look for that hard target that they saw. And if we could pick it up, we'd throw it in the, in the bin. And if we couldn't pick it up, they had a tugger wire that came down and went to a snatch block at the far end, the closed end of the bin, and then you could drag that tugger wire out mm -hmm. and wrap it around whatever it was, which was usually a handrail or grating, you know, the normal crap that's down there, and drag it into the bin. So Chad had been doing that for hours and hours, and it was time for the belch, or not the belch around, but the diver change out. 
And we had, for some reason, really bad comms that day. Today, that bill would be up on the surface, and they'd fix them damn comms. Back then, it was, can you make it work days? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, we can make it work. So the decision was to not trip out the bin. Usually, they take and they dump the bin during diver turnarounds and bell turnarounds. They decided not to. So Tad did me a huge favor, and he brought a three-quarter inch poly line back to the bell that was attached to the bin, and he tied it around the ring at the bottom of the bell. You know, so you got bell, and then you got stage. Well, it was tied not at the very bottom, right here. And it was, I don't know why he did it, because they had sonar. They could have walked me straight there. Right. But he, you know... That's what we do. Well, we, we put down lines. Yeah, I mean, that's right. it was nature. a down yeah. line. Yeah. You know. It was yeah. a traveling, traveling line. line. Yeah. And he did me a huge favor. So then all I would have had to do is pop out, go down the traveling line, boom, bada bing, bada boom, might have been there. Well, <laughs> they decided they were going to trip out the bin while we were changing out, and they didn't tell us. Or if they did, we weren't smart enough. Comms, yeah. I don't know. I'm sitting in the bell. Tad is standing in the bell with his helmet off. I'll never forget it. Black helmet, back black 17B, and it was off like this. And we're talking, you know how it is when you're having a turnaround. And all of a sudden, the bell goes, whoop, and Tad, and a wave comes flying in wow. the bell. Oh. And Tad is screaming, all stop, all stop. I'm thinking that the, we were on a crossover. The crossover broke, and I'm thinking that we're swinging through like this, and we're going to hit bottom. Young guys, this is going to happen to you. You're going to put your hat on your head so many times that you will not think about putting your hat on your head. All I know is that as we're swinging, it, I know it took no more than three or four seconds. I probably had my neck down already on because I knew I was locking out. Mm -hmm. And all I can remember is somehow, by some providence, my helmet was on my head. And at sub C, we had these three-way valves. Up was topside gas, horizontal was like this was no gas, and then down was onboard, emergency gas. And I remember I fell across the bell and I slammed my gas on so literally with in less than five seconds my hat was on the entire bell was flooded except for a little bubble shit's floating everywhere Tad screaming all stop all stop and now I'm screaming at Tad put on your hat put on your hat put on your hat Tad's not putting on his hat he's screaming all stop Jeez. the whole shittery stops everything's cool the bell kind of writes itself but it's still got you know, four foot of water in the damn thing. Tad's screaming, I'll stop. I'm screaming, put on your hat. It flips upside down again. Wow. I can remember as we speak right now with all the calmness I could possibly have in the world, looking at Tad and just going, you're going to drown, motherfucker. And I'm good with it. I told you to put your damn hat on. You're not putting your hat on. Okay. And the difference was Tad knew what was going on. And the reason the bell righted itself was Tad wasn't very good at Marlin Pike Spike seamanship, <laughs> I'm guessing. And and he had tied like a clove hitch <laughs> and it slipped. So the bell went good. Oh, and you. then it grabbed and the bell flipped. I just remember it so well. And classic, you know, 19, said it'd be in early 90s diving. We figure it all out. We get everything squared away. We blow the water out of the bell. Thank God it didn't get up into the scrubber. It didn't get into the radio. Or if it did, I don't freaking remember. Tad never put his hat on. I'm, <laughs> st I'm still mad still at him. Still didn't Tad. put his hat on. <laughs> yeah, I'm still mad at him about that one. I still talk to the guy. And um, good dude. And we get everything straight, and the supervisor's name was Cecil, and he was a year or two ahead of me in dive school, probably two years ahead of me. He goes, oh, okay, how you feel? I'm like, well, aside from the fact that I'm fairly certain we almost died, I'm doing great. He goes, okay, you ready to lock out? You know, what do you say? 
can't be a pussy. I'm like, Frick, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Send I'll it. lock out. And he goes, okay, put your hat on, go sit on the stage. Well, what gets that going to do, dude? What, do we sit out there and freaking meditate for a little while? Just let's do this. So that's kind of my funny story. Yeah, it wasn't funny cool. at the time, but it was good. No, I'm sure it wasn't. That same sat, though, I, I'm i not a huge sat diver. I got six, eight, ten sat jobs under my belt, you know, because I... I'm an 80s diver, so sat was not as prevalent as it is now. You know, it was really kicking off when I got in there. But I've been in. I've done it. And um, this is another good thing for your young listeners, and the old guys will know exactly what I'm talking about. Everyone dies is just dying to get into sat. You know, that's their that's the, their glory. I'm going to be a sat diver, all this shit. They can't wait to do it. They're dying to do it. And the second that door slams behind you and you start getting pressurized, you know, you know, you ain't coming out for 30 days. You're like, oh, God, this sucks. <laughs> what Wait, they're paying. Yeah, what, <laughs> what have I, I done? <laughs> they're paying me. Oh, no. At that time, they paid us $600 a day to be stuck in the steel tube. You can't even flush your own freaking toilet. And then that's a story that if you've never heard, Donald Boone, look that one up. Have you ever heard of Donald Boone? You have. Uh, yeah, that would be it. What happened? <laughs> um, now let's let's hear that one. No, he just he got his ass sucked out of the toilet because his butt made a seal on the toilet, and he was at 250 feet. And when they flushed it, you okay. now have a delta P, and your butt, your sphincter is the weak link. <laughs> so, Mister Sphincter, well, the sphincter didn't go. Three and a half feet of his intestines went out. Wow. Yeah. And you know what he did? He reached in the toilet, pulled his three and a half feet of intestines out, and went and laid on his bunk, waiting for the doctor to come. They flew two doctors out, one guy with very little experience, another guy with a lot of experience. I think, if I recall, they forgot the scalpel. So they treated this guy with no anesthesia and a spider co, I'm guessing. <laughs> and, and, and you know what the guy said when the doctor locked in? Hi, doc. I just said, can you just kill me now? <laughs> That's wow. a true story. Wow. Talk about a colon cleanse. Yikes. Oh, oh, shit, huh? So, what the, oh, so anyway. Yeah, you know, it, it, the, the right kind of person, you like to read, you like to meditate, you like to just sit there and veg, you like staring at walls. Sat is for you, man. But, you know, you can see I'm a little animated and high strung. And it, if you're not diving, you're stuck. You're yeah. in a steel can. And I'd had enough. I wasn't doing it anymore. Some guys love it. I, I, Some I mean, guys that's, do love that's it. for them, you know. And I can remember. I, so many jobs under the sea, isn't there? Yep. And I can remember I, one day I woke up and I'm looking out the port. You know, cause you're, you're looking out the port. You know, you're a freaking monkey in a pen. And I was so mad at my wife. I'm like, God damn it, Christina left the window open again. And I look around, I'm like, oh shit, you're in a sad chamber. And I took out a Sharpie and I wrote, God, if you let me out of here, I promise to never do it again. <laughs> and that, that, Nobody ever painted it. Nobody ever cleaned it. I had a guy from the Gulf of Mexico three weeks ago come out here and have um, lunch with me. And he said, Jeff, you remember what you wrote? Because it, it got famous at Subsea. He goes, I saw it. I saw it on a sat a while ago. I said, no shit, man. That's funny. That's so, great. yeah, and I never did. That was my, and then it was a sat I didn't even want to be in. You know, it's so funny. You're dying to get in a sat, and then you're trying to get the hell out, and I had a Another guy was supposed to go in, and at the last minute he said, I ain't doing it. And my boss mm. came up saying, so I need you to go. I'm like, I don't want to. And he goes, oh, I don't care what you want. You're getting yeah. in that thing. <laughs> Say you go, you go. Yeah. Hey, when she goes, she goes. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of a trip. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? So just, you know, all I can say um, is, you know, my brother always talks about situational awareness. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, I guess I'll tell you one more story. I'm kind of out of stories a little bit, or I'm actually, well, whatever. It, it's another tragedy, you know, because that's the shit you remember. Yeah. And uh, we were doing a job up on up Point Conception, 
And every day the choppers would fly out. It was too far for the boats to come unless we were bringing a bunch of stuff. So personnel came back and forth on choppers. And um, it was on a McDermott barge. And there had been a helicopter accident in the Middle East um, a few months before where a chopper on a wet deck. So they told us. I don't know. I wasn't there. But it hit that chopper pad and slid off which I don't know how it happens, but that's what they told us. So they sent us out a cargo net, you know, one of those big hemp or manila nets, and we spread it out so the chopper would land on that. And oh, I was I was the deck foreman. I wasn't sat yet. I was waiting for my turn, and it was probably about 8 in the morning, and this chopper comes in, and I'm standing between two buildings, and literally the space between two buildings is about what these two tables are and I'm standing there talking to a guy and I said you know I'd like to see one of those crash one day you know that's I didn't say I have to I didn't say I'm gonna make it happen I said I'd like to see one that's a fucked no, it's up. one of those stupid things we say you know yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing yeah. to say yeah it's terrible but it's like saying man it'd be cool if that building caught fire you yeah. know so the next day, the bell, there's something wrong with the bell. And we got it on deck, and I'm up on the very top of the bell trying to figure out. I'm sure it's a comms problem because it's always a freaking comms problem on a bell, you know? So I'm up there, and there's a chopper sitting on the chopper pad, and they're, take, they're going to take in a couple of my friends and then a guy that's going in. His name was Boudreaux. No shit. Not making this up. Um, he uh, was going to go in and donate like a kidney to his son. And then the other guy was, I um, can't remember his name, but we're probably not supposed to use names, super famous McDermott superintendent, Joe. I don't remember his last name. And um, I'm sitting looking down, and I can hear, you know, your, your ear gets tuned to the job. You know, you can tell the compressor's quitting before the compressor quits because it makes a one hiccup. And um, I hear, wow, I go, the chopper doesn't sound right. And I look up just in time for the bird to come off the deck and then slam down, hit the deck. The tail boom goes flying off. The chopper comes up and heads straight for me. R what's left of the chopper. And in the time I could react from it's going to hit me to I got about this far around, it hit the counterweight on the crane and exploded into a million pieces. And if helicopters are made out of tin foil and foam, yeah. that's what they're, there was shit everywhere. So here's my story. One, I jumped off of the bell because the chopper hit and then flipped and ended up kind of upside down in the water right next to the barge. And I ran up to the bar, to the side of the barge, because I had two friends that were on that thing, or at least people I knew well. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking for them and looking for them. And I see one of them, and he's, he got thrown out of the chopper, and he's waving his hand. So I know he's all right, as far as I know. And then I see the chopper, and there's two dudes still in it. And um, there's, you know, the, the barge probably had 100 people on it. And there's probably 50, 60 of us. And they're all on deck. And everyone's yelling and pointing. And I don't know what got into me. I'm not a hero. My point is you never know how people are going to react. And you never know how you're going to react. Yeah, that day I reacted well. The next day, maybe not. I'm not saying anything. I'm not a SEAL. I'm not trained. I don't know that shit. I just get up in the morning and do my thing and, you know, whatever. But on that day, I decided to do the right thing, I guess. And I knew, and you could see the chopper was sinking. So I had on red wing boots and I kicked them off, threw my hard hat away. Back then we didn't bother wearing with life vests. And I saw this spot in the ocean that was clear of debris and didn't have that slick of the aviation fuel, whatever the hell they use. And I made one of the most beautiful, I got one more story I gotta tell you after this <laughs> one, it's great, it's worth it. And I made this beautiful dive and I nailed it right in the middle of that open spot and I went over and I'm trying to get 
the dude out of the chopper because it's sinking. And, you know, we're all used to those push button type of belts. Well, the choppers still use these kinds. You cam over. And I'm, I, and somebody yells, undo his seatbelt. So I undo the seatbelt and I get that dude out. And then I, the, the chopper's damn near underwater. But, you know, I was a surfer. I was a cool dude. And I get, I get down there and I get the next guy out. And I pull him out and he rolls over and he's just like this red foam coming out of his it terror. Yeah. And, and I'm looking up and there's like 40 dudes pointing at me yelling, get that. I'm like, what the fuck? Right, Why fuck you I'm guys. in here by myself. <laughs> right. Pieces of you shit. know, could you at least climb down and help? And a couple did. But, you know, so my rationale, right, wrong, indifferent, I don't know. But I, in an emergency 80% of the people will run around pulling their hair out, screaming. It just, they're worthless. 10% will do exactly the wrong thing. Whatever the wrong thing is, it's as if they've been briefed. They will do that. And then 10% will do the right thing. That's, that's, that's what I think. You know, and I just, so I've done CPR on two, maybe three people. I don't remember. You do, no, two. You do not want me to do CPR on you because neither one of them freaking left. So apparently I'm not very good at it. But I'll remember doing that one guy and his his chest was just mm. eggshells. It was disgusting. So that was a story. I'm going to tell you one more story, okay? Yeah. I, I, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to tell stories, but this is a good one. I like it. I love stories. All right. Yeah, this so is perfect. Kind of tell me a story. It. Okay. So I was a young diver. I wasn't a supervisor yet. It's probably grade two, maybe grade three. I don't remember. We're diving in this shallow water field, um, jet, hand jetting a pipeline down. And there was like three lift boats out there, each with a dive team. We're all jetting, 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 jetting. And uh, the guy that was a supervisor on my lift boat was this real old school guy. And he didn't like the stress of supervising. And we had a, something happen. So all the boats you know, kind of ganged up to each other and you know, so everyone could talk and we could transfer gear one boat to the other, whatever. And Carlos said, you know, I just don't want to be the supervisor. So I went to the superintendent and I said, hey, Jim, um, Carlos doesn't want to be the supervisor, but I'd like to be, you know, I hadn't, I'd supervised really small jobs, but not something with this many people. I go, I'd like to do it. And he, Jim says, if it's okay with Carlos, you can do it. And I said, Carlos is good. So good. So I'm now the supervisor big mistake because my head's about this freaking big <laughs> man i'm now and why i wanted to be the supervisor was it was winter and it was really cold and really shallow so we weren't getting any depth pay so you're spending two three hours in the water just together. miserable miserable <laughs> the supervisor only made one dive the last dive of the day and it was only to go take pneumos to see what you did in the ditch so I'm thinking that's for freaking me. <laughs> so I'm the supervisor now. I'm the boss. And I liked coffee in the chamber, especially if it's cold. And it's midnight now. It's midnight. And I want coffee in the chamber. And I want it a particular way. <laughs> it's got to be sweet and just right. And I would tell him I want the color to be the color of a mulatto princess's thigh. And I was very particular. And so they pick me up. It's freezing fucking cold. And they make you get sprayed with a freshwater hose before you get in the chamber to get all the shit off you. So they spray me. I look in the chamber. And not only is it not the color of mulatto princess's inner thigh, there's no coffee in there at all. And I am pissed. And this little tender, kind of a newer guy, his name was Rich Kelly, greasiest hair in the world, man. Anyway, it was his job to get my coffee. And I was furious. I was screaming, I want my coffee, I want it now, go get it. And he's like, you got to get in the chamber. I'm like, I'm the supervisor. I don't have to get in the fucking chamber if I don't want you. I want the coffee, go get it. So he goes ripping under the galley, he gets the coffee. Um, here's the chamber door. I don't know if your camera works. It's right here. I'm naked completely. My penis is right here. Rich comes, he's terrified. 
<laughs> he comes ripping around the corner. It's a wet deck. And he slips. It goes like this. The coffee made a perfect arc, like a rainbow. There was still coffee here when it touched my penis. <laughs> he nailed me with the entire cup. But the beauty of it all was there was still coffee in the cup. So there was these arcing, visualize it, your arcing thing of hot coffee connecting my penis to that cup. I mean, that's fantastic, isn't it? And I, it burned the hell out of my penis. I made him get me another cup and I got in the chamber. So there you go. I'll leave you Damn with that. Damn the rules. I need my coffee. With that image. Oh, oh my goodness. That's good. That's oh, good man. Oh, that, was, that was great. Yeah. Wow. Coffee on the wiener. Yeah. Coffee it on and around the wiener. No, it doesn't happen. <laughs> it, does <not> happen. <laughs> no, it really does. <laughs> no. <laughs> Never heard anyone. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure the, the uh, only person on earth that had that experience. That's great. Oh, my goodness. But, yeah, so, I, I mean, I, I was super stoked uh, before coming here. You know, really excited about about being here and doing this cool. episode. And now after and, the uh, penis story, you're yeah. really oh, excited. Yeah, super excited because yeah, you know me. and so yeah. excited. I, I just love it. <laughs> just love those stories not about penuses i mean you no want, no i you got i mean like dive now. story no oh, i don't okay. i mean like dive stories it's yes. what i love yeah why did everybody get quiet when i said i love it <laughs> anyways good. okay now it's really awkward yeah. anyhow you made it awkward. yeah well thanks a lot for having us yeah. this has been Thank an amazing you. time you guys it has came been all the way good, up here yeah. i appreciate it it's and, been a uh, good day. Yeah, yeah it's been a great it, uh, day. Hope it was worth your time and yeah, cool show. Really cool. Maybe I'll watch one. Once. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, I wish you guys the best, man. Yeah, for sure. Thanks Thank a lot you. for having yeah. us. For sure, yeah, this, you're welcome it's been anytime. a it's been a great time. Yeah, thanks for talking right. to our students. They they dig it. Yeah, they're good guys. Yeah, I I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Awesome. And thank right. you, Matt. Oh, yeah. yeah. How's the family, man? That yeah, little girl yeah. must be getting old, huh? Yeah, little girl's getting old, and I got an eight-month-old boy now. Oh, goodness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's good. We're growing. Well, you ain't quitting anytime nah, soon. Nah, nah. <laughs> I, Keep telling him he's going to have love, three more. I still love diving, man. I, I love my job. Mm, good. All right, well, awesome. Well, thanks a lot, and uh, hopefully you guys can uh, join us on the next episode of the Bottom Dollars Dive Shack. All right, guys. Mm. See you on the next episode. Yep. Right on.